Hey everybody, welcome into TechSag's Rewind, brought to you by T-Mobile. We love our friends at T-Mobile, and they want to remind you guys that not only are they a sponsor of this show, but they want you to visit T-Mobile.com slash Across America to learn more about how you can get value and coverage with T-Mobile. And a show of shows, where is Antonio Johnson? I'm not looking for him like in person. I'm looking for his accolades out there. He did not make the All-SEC team, one or two, and I'm just a little like, what? What's going on there? We talked about that with uh, OB and throughout the show. Chris Landry always breaks it down with his scouting report, the Texas A&M scouting report. He had thoughts on the NFL draft and what he tells players and how the whole evaluation process goes down. Gary Blair came in studio. We talked about those boots that he got from Texas and uh, where the team is at. And recruiting country, it is all about the recruiting right now with a week till signing day. Ryan Broniger in studio. It is Tex Ags Rewind. Five Aggies get on the uh, – all SEC team by the coaches, um, and we should be celebrating them, and we will. We'll give them their, their props and talk about that. But the fact that Antonio Johnson is not the sixth one out there, uh, one of the best DBs in the country, you can play him up close like a linebacker, play him back, the flex position to the best, is coaching, voting, malpractice. All right? It's just ridiculous. Here's your first team, Kenyon Green to Marvin Leal. Definitely uh, deserve those accolades. Second team, Isaiah Spiller, Jalen Watermeyer, Nick Constantino. No argument with all those guys. They deserve it, and I'm proud of them. But certainly one guy is absent, and it bugs me. I saw it on social media yesterday. I'm like, this can't be right. And, uh, of course, Antonio had the – he's he's a God that has a plan for him, and I believe that. But this is what you got to know about Antonio. Big hit, come to play every game, Johnson. 53 solo tackles, leads A&M. 79 – excuse me, 53 solo tackles, yes. 79 total tackles, second on the team. He had several big plays throughout the season, the most versatile player on that defense, one of the best defenses in the country. Pro Football Focus had him as the fourth highest graded cornerback in the entire nation. Yet that guy, like we've seen in years past, doesn't get voted all SEC by the coaches. With that, we begin the go hour with a guy that I know warned me that this was going to happen, not in so many words about Antonio Johnson, but when I first got here, you told me, yeah, even DeMarvin Leal last year didn't get the love that he deserved. Eric McCoy. Yep. Yeah, you can. Um, it, it's just, it's just, it's, it's what it is. You uh, now, first of all, I don't believe the coaches voted. No, it's some SID who doesn't yeah, watch the SID games. or a football ops guy. And you know, these are again, for the most part, guys that the old guard that still has a hard time remembering that the SEC extends beyond the, the Mississippi. Yep. Um, and surely has a problem, remember, it extends beyond the Sabine. Opting out for the bowl from the business perspective for the kid and also for the university and for the NFL. I don't like it, but that's the way it's happened. And it's our calendar schedule that we do, which got messed up. I've always said we should have the football season. We should have the bowl season. And then we should pick the four teams after the bowl season. The bowls would be more relevant. Now the bowls, we said this, right? When the playoffs started, the non-playoff bowl games, not relevant anymore. I hate to say it. It is for me. They're just not going to play. And, you know, that's just the way it is. Last one for you. Antonio, I like it. Last one for you. Antonio Johnson, we, we thought here he should have been all SEC from what we saw him play. He didn't get it. Just, uh, uh, and, and, you know, there's other reasons for it. But uh, your thoughts when you put on the film and you see Antonio Johnson for the X? Well, he grades out that way, you know, you know, uh, getting all this and all that. I mean, the, the awards are particularly if it's not statistic based, you know, I don't know. I mean, people, this guy's a really good nickel. That is a unique player. He's got length. He's an outstanding tackler. He's got great instincts. So he plays within the system well, but he reacts well to a lot of post snap reads. And he's got good coverability. He's got the size to cover a big slot or a tight end or a back. Yet he's got the athleticism to handle things, to handle some of the two-way goes. Um, you know, I, th- this guy has the skill set to play outside and play effectively. He's he's really good. Now, that's a guy that, you know, has come on, young guy, St. Louis, second year, just getting better and better. So, yeah, he's he's got the goods. He's, he's really good, and he's certainly graded out one of the better uh, defensive backs in the SEC this year. Blue-grade college player. How do you balance taking on – really good teams early on and not worry about the record as you're trying to learn and grow as a team? I think that's part of it, risk-reward. I mean, uh, it would just be like 
me going out on the golf course during the summer, I know what my handicap is, but I want to measure what your handicap is. If, if you're about a four, I want to see if I can play with you. You're going to have to give me a few strokes, but uh, at the same time, I want to be able to measure where our team is. I want to be able to see to be the best, you got to play the best. And uh, Texas had already played Stanford number one in the country, knocked them off, and they had played a very close game to Tennessee. In between that, they hadn't played up to that level. And if you look at our ball game, uh, we were up 11 to 3. But the worst thing that could happen, we had already shot, I think, uh, four threes during that time, mm -hmm. made three of them. And then you think you're invincible. You read your stats, and it says we're the best three-point shooting team in the country. We were at that time. Well, eventually that powder is going to run dry, and you've got to have a mid-range game. You've got to have a transition game. You've got to be able to score off turnovers. Uh, you got to have power post bump. Remember, they missed 10 out of their first 11 shots, and it should have been about 17 to 3, but that's on us. We made mistakes. We had some turnovers during that time. We learned from it, but the wheel went dry in the second quarter, and I think that's really what hurt us the second quarter. I'm curious, how has the NBA and even the WNBA changed the way women's basketball is played? Because you, you look at the league now, it's all about the three-point shot. Uh, it's not the NBA that I grew up loving. It's a different game now. And, and there's a beauty to it, too. Has that trickled down to, to women's basketball? The larger kids can handle the ball a lot better. I played or I coached back in the era where Cheryl Miller, Reggie Miller's sister, was a great player. She was the first 6'3 kid that could have played one through five. Now you have a lot of players that can do it. You look at Ryan Howard over at Kentucky that can play one through five. Or Aaliyah Boston at 6'5 that can play four or five doing a great job. These kids are versatile. They, they know the game better. They're doing the little things that we see sometimes in the men's game. Our kids take charges very well. Our kids uh, have the range uh, to be able to shoot from the men's three-point line. We've all got to finish our layups better, the driving layups under pressure. Uh, but everything else we do just as well as the men. We shoot free throws as well. We shoot the three as well. Uh, we do everything but the dunks, and we cannot do that. All right. Gary, what about uh, – I? we all saw the videos on social. You're, you're – uh, reaction to Vic and just the the smile the the just the relationship you guys you guys touched on it last you touched on it last week but I, I feel like that video kind of encapsulates your relationship I think you grow up with somebody and you bring them into your family tree when he left Sam Houston and came to Arkansas where I was a head coach we were already friends uh, it's just like Buzz was talking the other day. Uh, Holly, his wife, was assistant coach while he was an assistant coach at UTA. These relationships stay with you for a long time. And what you want to do is foster the relationships. You want to know about his kids, and he wants to know about my kids. But when that 94 feet get in front of us, or that golf course gets in front of us. It's, uh, it's not friends anymore. It's foes. It's competition. And I love to compete against Coach Schaefer in any sport, whether we're playing ping pong or pool or, or whatever. That's, that's what friends do. You measure yourself. And it was a heck of a game. Last year when we went to Austin, in his first year there, we were able to win by 66-61. This year, he got us. And, but until we meet again or until somebody meets Texas again, that's the way it's going to be, competition. But I will see Vic again on the golf course. <laughs> again. It's historic because it's unlike anything the school's ever seen. Help me understand the scope, too, because Texas for years has recruited it at a top 10 clip. Oklahoma, LSU, whomever, right? But what 
Alabama has done and what Georgia's done recently, is it typically top three class? So when you say, can you not eclipse, can you eclipse what you did this year? Does it really matter as long as you're in that little top three? No, range? no, 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 no. I was just talking about uh, the grandeur and the right. scope of the, this class. Can you ever get back to it? Because what a high bar it would be if you landed three of those five guys that I said earlier, you know, and there you you have to be, you listen to Josh Pate, right? Mm -hmm. He calls it the freezing point. Like you have to be below that freezing point to be able to beat Alabama, Georgia. Like you have to have the horses to do that. Every now and then you'll see a team like Purdue jump up and beat Ohio State. But there are maybe 10 teams in the country that have enough horses on their roster to beat Bama, Georgia, Michigan, Clemson, Ohio. Like you have to have the talent to do that, right? A&M is in that group of teams. No question about it. So you have to remain recruiting below that freezing point to be amongst that group of, of teams that can win on, at, in, against anybody on any given Saturday. So what is that freezing point if there is a number? Is it top five class ballpark? Yeah, I would think top five. Top seven probably is where you have to be each and every recruiting class, each and every cycle. Uh, to be amongst the elite in college football in terms of what your roster looks like with talent. And then there's the super elite, right? The one through three that's even a different category. Yeah, and that's where you get like Georgia's done it for you know, how many straight years in the mm -hmm. top three and, and Alabama's been – and then you've had that third spot kind of fluctuate between A&M's been up there. I know Texas had a class that was up there, LSU. So that kind of fluctuates. But that's why you've seen Georgia and Bama really dominate the sport, and especially Bama uh, over the last – Bama's done it for 10 years. but the last three or four years is those two schools, their, their overall records have been incredible because of their recruiting classes. By the way, the uh, Brownlow-Dindy news, to me, even though I wasn't surprised because I know how close it was, what was it, October 9th weekend, mm -hmm. whatever that was, um, that we, were, we actually were at the, doing the show from Rollo. But it still felt like, wow, it's really happening. Like The things that we knew were possible – or like, man, here it is. Well, you asked me in the break, when did I really start believing that this could be the number one overall class? And you have an idea, but, you know, like I always say, they got to close, and still, they got to go close. Like, you've got to go close Cam Dewberry. It's still a position of need. He's an elite player from a school that you've been really good at uh, with a head coach who's an Aggie. Like, there's a lot of reasons. Like, you've got to go close that recruitment out. Uh, you've got to go close Perk. It's going to be tough. Perk's, with his background in Louisiana, uh, Brian Kelly typically getting a new coach bump. Like, it's going to be tough. you got to go close him out because he's right down the road in Houston. you got to go win it. You know, like, you've still got a ton of work to do. But they can do it. And what – the really the recruitment or the commitment that gave me belief that, okay, this can be done, and this can be done at a historic level, was Walter Nolan won. Like, how that kind of permeated out of thin air from, okay, we had, had no kind of – inclination that he would be even be on the AM's radar until the summer when he shows up on the pool party and then it went so well there that he's wanting to come back and come back and then you get a relationship with Bobby Taylor and all of a sudden boom you land the number one defensive tackle in the country okay that was a, a big step in doing this Evan Stewart deciding to just out of nowhere commit to A&M again a recruitment that you were completely out of months before and you get him and the, those are indicators that this can be done. Like all the stuff we've been talking about, it's a realistic possibility now. Like it's not some, hey, if things go right, things are going right and you can do it. All right. Our thanks to T-Mobile for this Texas Rewind on a Wednesday. I want to remind you guys to like, subscribe, comment, share, do all the good stuff on social media so we show up at more places and we can continue to churn out this great content. Also go to texags.com to become a subscriber. Thanks guys.